I'm a biologist, so I, I try to interpret the molecular record that we have from now living organisms. Um, and so this slide gives an outline of the things I'm going to be talking about. And if you should get lost in all the phylogenetic trees that I'm showing you, once the slide shows up again with something else highlighted, there's a little bit of a reset and a switch in topic. So hopefully you can uh, retrain yourself to the thought of uh, my presentation. Uh, so I will start out with talking about gene duplications and deep molecular phylogenies. Uh, talk a little bit about properties of the last universal common ancestor. A little aside on the history of the translation machinery. And then uh, I think in the main part, I try to convince you that there is a, a, a record of major catastrophic events that happened early in the evolution of life. And I try to correlate those to things that might have happened on this planet. And then I end up uh, with a, maybe a tale of caution in for you who are not working in molecular evolution to not take uh, some of the dating attempts you read in the literature too seriously because uh, it's, it's essentially you get back often what you put in. Uh, so my, my introduction to my first publication in molecular evolution uh, goes back to an enzyme that is still dear to my heart, the ATP synthetase, an enzyme that synthesizes all the ATP in our bodies and in most, in really in all other organisms. Uh, and so we were working on eukaryotes and found an ATP synthase on the endomembrane system, which doesn't work as an ATP synthase, but uh, uses ATP to energize the eukaryotic endomembrane system. And uh, this ATPase and the ATP synthase from archaea and bacteria, so the two prokaryotic domains, uh, all of these ATP synthases, ATPases have in common that they consist out of catalytic and non-catalytic subunits. And if one is doing a molecular phylogeny for these subunits, one sees that the tree that one gets back is completely mirror symmetrical. We have uh, the catalytic subunits on one side, the non-catalytic subunits on the other side. And the explanation for that is that there was a gene duplication event that had happened before the first speciation event that separates bacteria from the archaea and the eukaryotic nuclear cytoplasm. Um, so this was a great finding because it allows us to place the last universal common ancestor on the branch that leads to the bacteria and the eukaryotic nuclear cytoplasm is the sister group to the archaea or maybe emerged from within the archaea. And so this is a, the last tree was a schematic. This is an actual phylogeny we see in dark font, all the eukaryotes, here the non-catalytic subunits, here the catalytic subunits, they group together with the archaea, and on the other side we have the bacteria, here and here, and so this would be the location of the last universal common ancestor, and on this central branch would be the gene duplication that gave rise to these two types of subunits. So this is pretty cool, uh, but I think we can get more information out of these ATP synthase phylogeny if you consider the actual structure. All of these ATPases have a head group that consists of an alternate arrangement of uh, catalytic and so-called regulatory subunits or non-catalytic subunits. Uh, so this alternation is present in the archaeotype, the very closely related eukaryotic vacuola type, and the FATPase. And then this ring of ATP hydrolyzing subunits rotates this stem around and this rotates this ring of proteolipids around in the membrane and then at the interface between the proteolipids and the so-called stator subunits that is where the ion either sodium or protons are translocated across the membrane. And there's a big difference in how these so-called proteolipids uh, are constructed. The typical a uh, proteolipid unit in bacteria and in mitochondria consists out of one hairpin loop and there is one ion translocating aspartate in one of these uh, alpha helixes that span the membrane. In halorchia there is a wide variety of different sizes uh, but ultimately it is 
12 of these hairpin loops that either are part of one molecule or uh, part of uh, a few molecules that form this ring and there are uh, 12 to 13 proton translocating sites per uh, functioning ATP synthase in archaea and in bacteria. In eukaryotes, however, this thing has changed. There only, there's only one uh, uh, proton translocating site and the other hairpin loop is no longer functioning. <coughs> and so if we then look at what does that, what might that mean for the ratio between uh, protons or sodium ions that are pumped per ATP molecule. So if you assume that uh, if this enzyme goes through one cycle, every ATP that is bound by a catalytic site hydrolyzes one ATP and every proteolipid uh, translocates one proton, uh, we get a ratio of four protons per ATP for the archaea and for the bacteria. Uh, and we get a ratio of two for the vacuola ATPs. So meaning the vacuola ATPs has way more power in translocating the protons across the membrane than the bacteria and archaea, which makes this an irreversible enzyme. It only can pump protons uh, under physiological conditions. You cannot reverse this enzyme to make it synthesize ATP. And then we can reconstruct the, how did this molecule look in the past? Where did the different gene duplications occur? So early on, we start with an enzyme that doesn't have a catalytic subunit. Here we have the gene duplication. Uh, and here, in case of the eukaryotes, we have this larger protolipid emerging. So the most parsimonious reconstruction then would say that um, at the ancestor of the archaea and eukaryotes, and in the last universal common ancestor, we had a small type of proteolipid, and we already had regulatory or catalytic and non-catalytic subunit, uh, making this a reversible enzyme, a dedicated uh, an enzyme that can work both directions as ATP synthase uh, or as a, a, a proton pump, whereas before this duplication happened, when all six of these subunits were still catalytically active, we would have an enzyme that acted as a dedicated proton pump. And so this, this finding that the last universal common ancestor already had uh, membrane ATPase, ATP synthase sitting in its membranes uh, that was able to translate <coughs> the chemical potential of ATP into an ion gradient uh, that is in a little bit of conflict to the so-called progenote concept from Carl Voss and George Fox. Uh, Carl Voss described the progenote as an organism uh, that uh, lived before a relationship between genotype and phenotype was established. So there wasn't really a genetic system. The components of the cell were still evolving. And uh, so this would be the, the tree of life sketch according to early papers from Carl Rose. We start out in RNA world. We have this progenote. And then the bacteria, eukaryotes, and archaea independently emerge from uh, this progenote uh, world, maybe the eukaryotes a little bit later, so he changed his mind on that. Whereas many other molecular phylogenies, and especially the ATP synthase, would suggest, yes, we might have had this progenote phase where things like translation and ATP synthesis were optimized, but the last universal common ancestor already uh, was a cell that had membranes, that had a genetic system that used 20 amino acids, uh, <coughs> And then we have later on, we have uh, two successive bifurcations, the first leading to the bacteria, and the next one then uh, separating the archaea from the eukaryotic uh, nucleocytoplasm. And then we have many endosymbionts uh, moving into the eukaryotes. And that is very similar, this interpretation of molecular evolution uh, is very similar to what Antonio Lascano's group uh, published that uh, namely that the last universal common ancestor really was a prokaryote. It was not a progenote, a non-precellular organism, essentially. Uh, the same uh, work from uh, similar findings from Gustavo uh, Setano Anoli's lab, uh, and the last one, uh, Aaron Goldman's data bank uh, for uh, identifying genes that were present in the last universal common ancestor. I think the, these papers that are based on overall genome content, so should be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, and the reason is there is a lot of horizontal gene transfer uh, going on, indicated by this arrow. And if a gene comparatively recently is transferred between bacteria and archaea, 
it could have evolved somewhere in the lineage leading to these bacteria and then later on was shared with archaea. It doesn't mean that this gene was present in the last universal common ancestor. And so I have another example for that uh, later on in my presentation. Um, so these gene duplications uh, are really cool, early gene duplications, because we can look further back in time to the time before the last universal common ancestor. And so a really cool example for that are these amino acid RNA synthetases. The enzymes that take an amino acid attaches to the, it to the tRNA, and then the tRNA amino acid goes to the ribosome and helps to translate the messenger RNA into a protein. And so these, these enzymes are two classes of amino acid tRNA synthetases, and within each class, these enzymes are clearly homologous. Here's a phylogeny of the class 1 amino acid RNA synthetases, and here we have uh, the valyl and isoleucyl amino acid RNA synthetases. They appear to be pretty closely related, but yeah, this divergence certainly happened before the last universal common ancestor because all now living organisms uh, have these two different enzymes. Uh, so then we can ask the question if we take these molecular sequences and we reconstruct the ancestral sequence, uh, what does the ancestral sequence contain in the places where the genetic code requires a valine or an isoleucine? And there are three possibilities. Possibility one is that both amino acids were already part of the genetic code at the time these two enzymes diverged from each other. There was another system to charge the tRNAs, uh, and both isoleucine and valine are part of this ancestral enzyme. Alternatively, there could be a neofunctionalization, maybe the ancestral enzyme the ancestral genetic code used only valin, so we would only find valin in the ancestral sequence, and then later on uh, isoleucyl uh, evolved, and the third possibility is the ancestral genetic code just didn't care, it incorporated valin or isoleucine, as long as it was a hydrophobic amino acid, things were fine, so that would be a subfunctionalization that happened. Uh, and these three models, either inventing something new, uh, or uh, subfunctionalization or a takeover. Uh, if we look on this axis, the probability that we reconstruct an amino acid in the ancestral sequence at the time before Luca when these two enzymes diverged from each other, and we plot here the probability how certain we are that this amino acid was in this position. In case of neofunctionalization, we would expect that the amino acid that was present in the past. Uh, would be predicted, would often be predicted to have been there with 100% certainty, and the other one would have been ab absent. In case of uh, subfunctionalization, <coughs> we would get this curve number three. Uh, the ancestral sequence really didn't care. We wouldn't be sure which amino acid to reconstruct in the ancestral sequence. Uh, and the takeover would be this curve number four. And curve number four, surprisingly, is what we find. Uh, this is from a simulation, and we see there is a bulge in the middle, but that reflects that those are two hydrophobic amino acids that frequently replace each other, so it's not surprising that we find sometimes yeah, the protein doesn't care what amino acid is, is in there, and the same uh, for the actual data. Uh, but there are many positions where, uh, with high certainty, we can reconstruct in the ancestral enzyme either uh, valine or isoleucine in different positions of this sequence. So it seems then that if when the uh, organisms came out of the single biopolymer world, maybe it was an RNA world, uh, there was an uh, invention uh, of tRNA and ribosomes, uh, and also at this point in time an RNA-based tRNA charging mechanism, so that is the invention of the protein world. In this world where proteins are being invented, uh, the genetic code already was expanded to include both isoleucine and valine. Uh, and then later on, after the genetic code is established, we have the takeover <coughs> of the charging machinery uh, by proteins, so we invent the amino acid tRNA synthetases, uh, but that is after these two amino acids were already part of the genetic code. And then uh, maybe later on we have the addition of tryptophan. Uh, 
that actually there's a, there's a core evolution between the amino acid RNA synthetases uh, and uh, the expansion of the genetic code. But all of these things had happened already a long time before the last universal common ancestor. So, conclusion from the first part, uh, the last universal common ancestor was a sophisticated prokaryotic cell that had uh, membrane gradients that used ion gradients to synthesize ATP and that used ATP to synthesize its membranes. Uh, LUCA does not appear to be to have been a progenote and the expansion of the genetic code did not parallel the divergence of the amino acid TNA synthetases, rather amino acid TNA synthetases acquired their specific or amino the, the charging of tRNAs with an amino acid acquired the specificity in cells uh, that charge the tRNAs by other means, by non-protein uh, means. Okay, so switch topics a little bit, uh, staying with the ribosomal tree of life. Um, if we look at the evolution of organisms so down here, we have the last universal common ancestor. Uh, these, the width of these, this line represents how many proteins were already part of the ribosome. So there are uh, about 36 proteins now that have a so-called universal distribution that are found in bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And so these 36 proteins, so when we wrote this paper, we had 29. Uh, these were added to the ribosome before the last universal common ancestor, and presumably they were added at a time where the genetic code was not complete yet, where the genetic code was expanding and more amino acids were added to the genetic code. So if a ribosomal protein became part of the ribosome before an amino acid was added to the genetic code, we would not expect uh, this amino acid that was added later to the genetic code to be placed in a position that was absolutely essential uh, to be there. So uh, we used a reconstruction of amino acids that were part, uh, that were conserved along this branch. And our reasoning was, <coughs> if you look at the last universal common ancestor, uh, we would expect amino acids that were late additions to the genetic code to be underrepresented in these uh, ancient uh, proteins. And so we can do that, and we wrote a paper about that. And, but then we said, OK, we can turn this whole thing around. We can be agnostic about where in the tree is the last universal common ancestor located. Uh, we just look at all branches in the tree of life. And we look how different is the amino acid composition from the average composition of present day organisms. And so the branch here are the bacteria, the eukaryotes, the archaea, and that is the phylogeny is based on ribosomal proteins. These, the universally conserved ribosomal proteins. And we see the one branch with the largest deviation from the present day amino acid composition is this branch connecting the bacteria to uh, the other organisms. And uh, the other deviations are in organisms that are either extreme halophiles that live at very high salt concentrations or that live at high temperatures. And the reason I show you this, uh, tell you this story is that so, yeah, we find this bias in amino acid composition. Surprisingly, uh, it turned out that this bias does not reflect extreme thermophiles. So there were, were papers written at the time, starting with Carl Stetter, uh, that, who mapped uh, growth temperature onto organisms, and he found that deep branching organisms in the bacteria and in the archaea are often extreme thermophiles. So it led to this vision that the deeper part of the tree, the early part of the tree of life, had occurred at very high temperatures. And so now uh, we find that the last universal common ancestor located down here does not have a composition that reflects uh, extreme thermophily. And that finding is very similar to an earlier finding by Nicole Thier, uh, who worked with Manuel Le Gouy at the time, uh, where they looked at the composition of the ribosomal RNA and used the ribosomal RNA as a thermometer uh, to predict at what growth temperature does this organism live, and that works very well for uh, now living organisms, and they extrapolated that back to the ancestral sequences. A uh, more recent paper used uh, by Bosso from the same group, Manolo Gui's group, 
used the more sophisticated approach. They used only uh, the part of the RNA that base pairs uh, in the ribosome, which is the part that is most sensitive to uh, temperature, temperature changes. So if there are more bonds between these two branches. If there are more Gs and Cs, the organism is more uh, able to withstand higher temperatures. Uh, and they uh, predicted that the last universal common ancestor had an optimal growth temperature around 60 degrees Celsius, whereas the ancestors of the two domains, the ancestor of the archaea and bacteria, had a predicted growth temperature around 80 degrees Celsius. When they did the same thing for protein sequences, uh, the result was even more dramatic. It went from 20 degrees up to 70 degrees Celsius, so the last universal common ancestor would have been a very uh, well, essentially like today's bacteria living at 20 degrees Celsius. But these data, I think, are probably impacted by horizontal gene transfer and by the prediction which proteins were actually present in the last universal common ancestor. So that this, I would not believe that. I think this 50, 60 degree is a more uh, reliable uh, story. So this, this finding that the last universal common ancestor was a less thermophilic organism than the ancestor of the bacteria and the archaea uh, is, is interesting and it relates to something that uh, I think my first paper in astrobiology was on uh, impact frustration of early life and um, so to, to explain that, uh, step back a little bit uh, and we look at uh, the first critic of the tree of life concept, Charles Darwin, when he was this age. He wrote, the tree of life should perhaps be called the coral of life because the base of the branches is dead. So he, he realized really in, in the tree of life there is a living layer sit, sitting on top of these dead ancestors. And so that inspired this drawing, the coral of life, uh, maybe modified after Darwin. We have the present day living organisms here and here are all the ancestors and most of these ancestors are dead. Uh, there are only a couple of lucky ancestors whose genes survive to, who have lineages which survive to the present day. The deeper we go in back in time, the more uh, of the biota that exist at this point in time are extinct. And here uh, is the lineages coalesced back to the last universal common ancestor. But this image then would suggest that the last universal common ancestor did not live alone on this planet. It just appears to be a singular organism because all of these lineages didn't make it uh, in to the present. Um, so if one takes this image literally and one assumes that, yes, there is a balance between speciation events and extinction events, uh, one can describe this process, this process of tree formation of the surviving lineage by a coalescence process, and it follows the so-called Kingman coalescence. And in the Kingman coalescence, the time that the last two nodes coalesce back to their common ancestor takes about half the time that the coalescence process one considers is in operation. So if one does simulations of this Kingman coalescence process, one gets trees which look like this. So you have always a the two deepest branches are very long, and that is true for every clade one looks at. So if you look at this clade, these two branches are very long. If one looks at this clade, <coughs> these two branches are long. So the two deepest branches roughly on average cover half the time of the coalescence process one looks at. If you look at real data, though, it is exactly the opposite. We have, this is a bacterial phylogeny based on ribosomal RNA, a cultured and uncultured organism, and it really looks like a big explosion. There is a big radiation happening here, and it is very different from what we would expect under the Kingman coalescence process. And so uh, there are many possible explanations for that. The uh, uh, most conservative would be this is undersampling. If you w were to do more sampling, the picture might change. Uh, the alternative is it is really there is a radiation that happened early in. Uh, bacterial evolution, and it could be due to an invention that was made that allowed organisms to move into new ecological niches, or it could be the result of a mass extinction event where kind of most of the biota existing at the time were uh, taken out, uh, and only organisms that before this catastrophic impact had adopted to higher temperatures actually survived this impact frustration event. And so this 
would be then this picture. We have the three domains of life. Uh, we have here this nearly complete impact frustration and these two lineages survive and then give rise to archaea, bacteria and uh, to the eukaryotic nucleocytoplasm. And if one tries to pinpoint where in Earth's history could have been such an event that selected for extreme thermophily, uh, one possibility is a late heavy bombardment at uh, 3.8 billion years before the present. Not sure, so some uh, astronomers uh, tell me the late heavy bombardment didn't really occur. In that case, maybe it was the tail of the early heavy bombardment. I like this disturbance in the early history of the planet. So uh, if this was the cause for this extinction that then was followed by the radiation, uh, we could date the ancestor of the bacterial and archaeal domain to about 3.8 billion years, and the last universal common ancestor would have existed a long time before this late heavy bombardment occurred, so maybe somewhere down here. Um, as I said before, uh, the last universal common ancestor certainly was not alone. There were probably other lineages existing at the, at the same time, and that is maybe somewhat in conflict with what I said about uh, this nearly complete uh, frustration of life through a major impact, um, but maybe it weren't many lineages. So if we go back to this sketch of the call of life, uh, we have horizontal gene transfer, and if we go back in time, many of the gene transfer events will have happened between organisms that are now extinct to two lineages that are still alive today. Uh, and especially the amino acid TNA synthetases reveal that there were other lineages around at the time of the last universal common ancestor. Maybe I skip that. Uh, a nice example for that are the so-called homeoleals that we discovered a couple of years ago. Those are genes that have the same function, but they're in sequence, and maybe in some characteristics like antibiotic resistance, they are very divergent. Uh, and organisms can switch between these different types of homoalleles through horizontal gene transfer, so they can exchange one serial TNA synthetase against another serial TNA synthetase. Usually, they take it from very closely related organisms. And so, one of these homoalleles uh, we discovered in archaea, uh, it's an enzyme that uh, charges the serial TNA with serine. Uh, it has a very disjunct distribution, which is typical for these uh, homeoleals. And if you look at the phylogeny of the serial TNA synthetase itself, uh, we see that this rare form is a very deep branch. Uh, it branches off way before the place where we would normally place the last universal common ancestor, suggesting that there were organisms existing at the same time as the last universal common ancestor that carried this rare type of the enzyme and transferred it back into the existing biosphere. Okay, so conclusion, second part, uh, tree shape and amino acid composition of ancestral sequences suggest a bottleneck in the early evolution due to increased environmental temperature at the base of the bacterial and archaeal domains. Uh, studies of Horizontal gene transfers of amino acid TNA synthetases suggest so that there were more than two lineages that actually passed through this bottleneck. Uh, let me finish two seconds uh, with a comment on dating early phylogenies. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the Tree of Life published by Ciccarelli et al. based on the so-called tree of 1%. Uh, essentially, it's ribosomal proteins. It's about 1% of the genome. Uh, here, these red dots indicate the two domain ancestors, the bacterial and the archaeal domain ancestor. Down here would be the last universal common ancestor. And we see that uh, these, this point that I suggested maybe is at 3.8 billion years is very far away from the last universal common ancestor. Same on the ribosomal protein that we calculated. Uh, this, if this is 3.8 billion years before the present, this is way back in uh, in the tree, at least based on substitution events. And that doesn't change if you take the new uh, candidate filer that the Benfields group published on recently. Uh, this would be the domain ancestors, and down here would be the last universal common ancestor. So 
Uh, this is the same thing for the ATP synthase tree that I showed you before. Here in red, the domain ancestors. In green, the two places where the last universal common ancestor is located on this tree that had this ancient gene duplication. And so we see if this is 3.8 billion years, uh, there are two possible conclusions uh, that we can draw from this. Uh, either substitution rate in early evolution was much higher than it is today, or else uh, history of uh, life falls off the history of our planet. And that is not a, I don't really want to suggest that. So it really appears there is, there is much more evolution, much, many more substitution events happened early in the evolution of proteins. And if that is true, uh, and we use a phylogenetic approach that tries to date early evolution events and approximate, uh, we assume, a constrained molecular clock running, uh, then the time we get, we estimate for the last universal common ancestor is pretty much close to the lower constraint that we put into our phylogeny. So if we say uh, the earliest possible time uh, is given by these old zircons that uh, which indicate that water was present in that environment at 4.4 uh, billion years before the present then. That is very close to the time we would estimate for the last universal commences. If we use another time, uh, we get the same result. So because there's so much substitution that happened early on in the evolution, uh, we really push this time, the estimated time, to the lower boundary. And with that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. <laughs> <laughs>